It sounds so good to be able to hear uh, God's kingdom, God's church worship. Are you glad to be in church today? I hope so. I hope that you're excited about being in church today. I, I know this uh, way back in the day when ice cream Sundays used to cost a whole lot less. Ten-year-old boy walked into a hotel cafe and took a seat at a table. A waitress walked over and uh, set down a, a glass of water right in front of him, and the little boy asked this question. He said, how much is a hot fudge sundae? And the, the waitress said, well, it's, it's 50 cents, son. He pulled, pulled out some change in his pocket, and he began to, to count. He began to count, and, and at that point, over by the hostess table, there was a, a line starting to form of adults who were waiting to be seated, and she, she was growing rather impatient with this little boy counting his, his change. And so she kind of said in a very irritated and kind of a rough tone, she said, well, what, what do you want? And he said, well, I, I guess, how much is a plain dish of ice cream? She said, well, it's, it's 35 cents. So, so the little boy counted his change again. And he said, well, I guess, I guess I'll just have a plain dish of ice cream. She walked off kind of in a huff, and he sat there, and soon she, she brought this little cup of ice cream to him, set it down in front of him, and, and right next to his little dish, she set a bill, and, and he began to eat. He finished his dish of ice cream, and he picked up the bill, and he walked over to the cashier, and he, he, he paid his, his bill, and he walked out of the room. When, when the waitress came back, she, be, she began to wipe down the, the table of where the little boy had been eating his ice cream because he had made a little bit of a mess. And she was kind of taken back and she swallowed kind of hard as to what she, she saw on the table because right next to his dish was 15 cents, her tip. I read this week uh, a quote from a, a gentleman, an author. He said this, I've been given everything that I need to be a blessing to others. I have been given everything that I need to be a blessing to others. I also read this week, perhaps you and I have grown so accustomed to hearing statistics that we kind of grown a deaf ear to them. Perhaps we've been anesthetized to them, but maybe we've grown so comfortable and so familiar with statistics that we no longer really pay attention to the numbers that, that go in front of what they're trying to describe. But I read this week that there are 1.75 billion people in our world who are desperately poor. Let that sink in. That's a whole lot more than are in this room. 1.75 billion people. One billion of them are hungry. Millions of them are, are being trafficked in slavery at this time. Matter of fact, each year, 2 million children it's estimated that 2 million children, like that 10-year-old boy in that cafe, 2 million children will, will be exploited to commercial sex, sex trafficking. Every five min, minutes, about 90 children a day die from preventable diseases. Every five minutes. More than half of all those who live in, in Africa, in one of the countries in Africa, more than half of them don't have access to modern health services like you and I do. And as a result of that, millions of them die every year to diseases that could literally be prevented by just a single shot in the arm. We are, we are as a church, the modern-day version of the the first Jerusalem church, except for the fact that we're the wealthiest generations that, of Christians ever. We are, are far more educated. We're far more experienced. We, we can literally travel around the world in 24 hours. We can literally send a message anywhere in the world in milliseconds. We have the most sophisticated research available at the very tips of our fingers. We have, we have ample resources. Matter of fact, just 2% of the world's grain harvest, 2% of the world's grain harvest would be enough 
to feed those who are hungry. 2%. There's enough food on our planet to, to promise every single person on the planet 2,500 calories a day. We have enough food to feed the hungry. We, ha we have enough rooms in our homes to house the orphans. The storehouse is full. The problem is not the supply. The problem is the distribution. See, see God has given us, our, our generation as a church, everything that we need to be a blessing to, to others. But we often fail to look at, at our lives with what we have rather than what we lack. I think a lot of us have spent a, a, a vast majority of our time pursuing what has been known as the American dream. And the American dream is, is literally spent pursuing what you define it as what you want in life. But the good life, the good life that Jesus talks about is pursuing what God would want for your life. And so I have to ask you again, are, are you convinced are you convinced that the, that the Christian life is the good life? That what God has for you, that what Jesus describes for you, how Jesus defines the Christian life, that the Christian life is the good life, are you convinced of that? This, this good life that Jesus describes is, is a righteous life. And this righteous life is the Christian life. I, I want to give you two words that I, I really want you to think about this morning. We're going to say them together. Uh, the first word is the word measure. Measure. On the count of three, would you say that word measure? One, two, three. Measure. That's almost as good as you singing, right? Here's the second word for you. It's the word motive. Count of three. Would you say the word motive? One, two, three. Motive. motive. How you measure and what's your motive? How, how do you measure? What's your motive? Like when it, comes to, when it comes to righteousness, how do you measure it? When it comes to the good life that Jesus describes for it, what's your motive for doing it? How you measure? What's your motive? For us to get a really good start on this, I want to read from Matthew chapter 6. It'd be a good place for you and I to start. And, and then if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6 as we continue on to this, this passage of Scripture that Jesus is preaching from a sermon. This passage from a sermon Jesus is speaking on a mountainside. And I, I want to share this with you because it's a very powerful and practical. Matter of fact, it's, I'm, I'm going to give you a very profound principle for your life. It'll help you for the rest of your life. As we get through this passage today, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 1, it simply says this, be careful. That's good. We can stop there, right? Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. You will have, if you do that, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, so when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets like the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by other people. Truly, I tell you that they have received their reward in full. But Jesus said, but when you, when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving might be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret, he, he will reward you. He will reward you. Years ago when my sons were just getting into competitive sports, my second son, Jess, um, my second son, Jess, came, came to Ruth Ann and I said, Mom, Dad, I, I, we, we'd, I'd really like to play basketball. And there's a, there's a league that's going to form, and he, and he used the he said, it's at a church. So he knew that we wouldn't say no. And, and he, he said, maybe you've heard of this, it's called upward basketball. Some of you probably participated with that or coached in that at some point. And, and so I, we said, sure, Jess. And so we signed him up, and, and the, the, he, he got that calendar that had that day circled when his first game would be. And so I showed up at the gym um, we all showed up at the gym to watch Jess play basketball, and he had never really played basketball like that before, but we showed up there. And, and as I sat down in the, the, the bleachers that day or in the chairs that day, I, I noticed very quickly there wasn't a scoreboard. The scoreboard wasn't on. 
So I said, hey, some, somebody, they, we got we to figure out who's going to win here. Put the score on. And a guy, a brother sitting behind me who had lots of children already go through this program, he said, hey, hey sir, they, they don't keep score in this league. They're too young to keep score. They, they, don't, they don't keep track of this. So, so when Jess got in the car after the game, I, I congratulated him. I said, hey, Jess, congratulations. On, you, you did a wonderful job playing basketball today. He said, Dad, we won. <laughs> I said, Jess, Jess, man, they, they, didn't, they, didn't keep, they didn't keep score. He said, Dad, I did. <laughs> I did, Dad. He said, Dad, it's kind of hard, too, while I'm out there playing to keep score in my head with all these other things going on. Could, Dad, could you keep score from now on? Let me know if I won. He, he had decided for at least that game to keep score by himself, but he wanted his dad to keep score later. And some of you this morning, some of us, we're trying to keep score ourselves, aren't we? Your measure in life, you're measuring life by your own standard. You're measuring the good life that you think you're pursuing by your own standard. And I, and I think that's why God wants somebody in here, maybe you, just to simply understand something. Like one of the first things that God does when you relinquish and you submit and he assumes control of your life is he becomes your scorekeeper. He becomes the standard by which you are going to have score judged. And, and by default, I know this, we all try to keep score. We all, matter of fact, it's not even just us that keep score. We let everybody else keep score on us, don't we? And, and it, let's be honest, it's hard to know if we're really winning in life. It's really hard to know if I'm, I'm really winning in life, especially in adulthood. I, I wonder about this all the time. There's some areas of my life and seasons of my life where I, I, I I'm pretty sure I win for a season. But there are other areas of my life that when I'm winning in certain sections of my life, there are other areas of my life that are really important to me, but I, I seem to be losing. And I, I can't keep up because I got like five different things going on at the same time. Like I, I, got this, I got this family thing going on. I got this financial thing going on. I got work to keep up with and I got relationships to deal with and and, and they don't all work together in life. Matter of fact, they all kind of seem to compete for a lot of different areas in life. And, and it's, it gets really hard to keep score, to know whether or not you're winning. And, and listen, we, we live in a world, we live in a world where there are literally permanent reminders of how everybody else keeps score even if they're not playing the same way I am, even if they don't have the same calling, even if they don't have the same circumstances, even if they're not in the same situations, we're all living on, somehow on the same platform, being fed the same false images, and we're left wondering, is, is their life really that much better than mine? Maybe I just need a better photographer. Post more often. Because we measure, the, we measure the good life by a certain standard that we set or we let other people set a standard. And, and back in the day, listen, I don't know about you, but back in the day, remember when you used to compare yourself to a very small circle of people? Like there weren't that many people around you. you it was just whoever was around you. There weren't that very many people to compare yourself to because, and because of that, you thought you were pretty good. You thought you were pretty good at whatever you were trying to compare yourself to because there weren't that very many people to compare yourself to. But now social media and things like YouTube have literally changed the standard of comparison. And it literally has changed the standard of how we measure. Back in the day, even further back in the day, when Jesus preached this sermon, he, he, literally, he literally changed the standard of what he wants us to measure our lives by. And the Bible says this. In Matthew chapter 5, just the chapter before that, he says this, that, that Jesus went up on a mountainside and he, and he sat down and his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. The, the text literally says physically that Jesus went up, meaning this, 
that he, he was described, the, the Bible, Matthew's describing geography. He went up in, in elevation. He went up in elevation. And, and, he, and he sits down on a mountainside and he begins to teach these people. That's, that's the physical motif of this text. But as he begins to teach about this good life that he wants us to live, Jesus doesn't elevate what's already been said. He literally kind of excavates and takes away from what's already been said. He begins to dig in certain areas of our lives that, that you and I need to learn about when it comes to how, how do I measure and what am I motivated with. Jesus begins to dig beneath the surface of our life. And, and listen, you, when, listen, when you really have a, a, an incredible encounter with God, when you really, really, really meet Jesus, the very first thing that Jesus is going to do is he's going to challenge your values. And he's going to challenge what you say you believe. Like, we want Jesus to build our life up. We want Jesus to elevate our standard of living. We want, we want the blessings that God talks about. We want Jesus to raise us up and build us up and to give us all those wonderful promises that he talks about in Scripture. But listen, if he doesn't first dig out enough place in our heart, uh, enough for a foundation that, that will be steady and stable enough to handle, to withstand some of the circumstances and some of the situations in our life. Listen, the very first thing that Jesus, the very first thing that proves the, the presence of God in your life is that he, he begins to challenge your value system. He, he begins to challenge your beliefs. And, and do you know how you can know if you've met with God? Do you, do you know how you can know if you've been with Jesus? Like were you challenged? Were your values challenged? What you, at the very core of who you are, were your values challenged? Because when he started to preach that day and teach that day, he said things like this. Blessed are, are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And right away we start to think, wow, I'm a little confused because it seems like what Jesus is telling me is that those who look like they're not winning most of the time, a lot of the time, are actually the more blessed ones. Blessed are the meek, for they will, they will what? They will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hungry. Hungry for what? For, for righteousness, for they will be filled. Like what's the blessing in being hungry? It's righteousness. That's the blessing. Like in every one of those, in every one of those statements, we call them beatitudes in, in, in our world today, but in every one of those statements, Jesus gives you and I a, a brand new definition of what it means to be blessed by God. And they're always contrary to the cultural norms of our day. Values which, which are mostly external. Because everything in our world is about how you look. And like, like even we try to attribute that to God. Like as if God's blessing is going to somehow show up as a physical manifestation in your life. That somehow God is going to bless you materially. But when Jesus shows up, he, changed, he changes how you and I measure and he changes how, what you and I value. And the, the religious system of his day was corrupted by, by the elevation of appearances. Not, not the condition of your heart. So Jesus begins to challenge the value system that not only exists in the world, this is even more amazing. He, ex he challenges the, the value systems of the religious world as well, not just in the streets, but also in the synagogues, not just out in, on, the, on the curb, but as in the, in the church. Like the very first thing that Jesus did seems to me is he challenges the values of what, what we're supposed to measure. And Jesus begins to dig away. And, and it seems like Jesus just kind of overturns and he capsizes and he, and he just overthrows. And it seems like he just flips everything upside down. It seems as if Jesus is, is far less concerned with you playing the game right than you are if you're playing the right game. And I have a feeling that a lot of us in this room are playing the wrong game. 
We spend a lot of our time trying to figure out how to, how to play the game right. And, and we're, we're literally, we're measuring the wrong things. Like, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be tragic? Wouldn't it be tragic for you to spend your whole, whole life trying to get good at something that you weren't even supposed to be playing? To win the approval of people who, who literally don't have a throne to sit on. To, to get really good at something that, that probably isn't even good for you. Our lives kind of get sucked into this comparison that, we, that literally has nothing of any value to it, nothing really good for us. We start good, getting good at winning. But can I ask you, what are you winning at? What are you winning at? Years ago, back, back in the day, when I was a kid, man, video games were so much different than they are today. I don't know if you remember this. We're like, whatever happened to this game? Like Atari Breakout. Remember that? Remember, you sit there and you try to knock that bar off the top. Or what, whatever happened to, to Pac-Man? Remember that? You chase this little dot around. What, whatever happened to Galaga or Space Invaders or, or Tecmo Bowl, my favorite? Whatever happened to those games? It seemed like it was an entire different level of, uh, uh, of skill and mobility back then. It seemed we were doing really important things back then trying to win those games. The other day I was sitting in the doctor's office and a little boy was sitting right across from me and I didn't ask him his name, but I, I just kind of watched him for a little while because he was, he was on his phone or he was on his mom's phone, probably his phone. He was, he was probably about seven or eight years old and he fascinated me. I just watched him for five minutes straight because his facial expressions would change and his tongue would stick out and all, all he was doing was this. Like all, all day, like the whole time I was in there, I, I watched him for a while and, and I, I realized, you know, as he's doing this, there's absolutely no strategy involved in this kid and the game that he's playing. I, I didn't know the game that he was playing because I don't play games on my phone. I'm a preacher. I, I read my Bible on my phone, right? <laughs> but this little boy, he sat there the whole time and he just kept, kept using his finger and his finger never moved from the position on his phone. And so I had to ask. I said, hey, son, what's that game you're playing? And he said, cookie clicker. Cookie clicker? I didn't hear, I never heard of that game. And he goes, it's an old game. You wouldn't know it. It's old. It's old. And I'm like, <laughs> dude. So I looked it up, 2013. I said, it ain't that old. I said, how do you play? And he said, well, you, you click the cookie. And I said, all right. Then what happens? After you click the cookie, do you get to move into like the kitchen and get more flour on you? Or do you, you get to steal secret recipes? Do you get to save a mom from something in the kitchen? I don't, what do you do? What do you do in this game? He said, no, 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 no. You just click the cookie. And he was kind of getting irritated with me. <laughs> and I said, well, what happens when you get, when you get a cookie? He goes, you get more cookies. <laughs> and what happens, after you, what happens after you get more cookies? When do you win? And he just looked at me with this puzzled look on his, on his face. He said, you click more cookies to get more cookies, to get more cookies, to get more cookies, <laughs> to get more cookies. Do you understand? I'm going to get more cookies. <laughs> and obviously this was very addictive to him. But I wonder. I wonder how, how many of us have been clicking on stuff, never asking the question, what's the goal of all this? What's the goal of all this? How will I know if I win? Do I, do I win if I just get your approval? Do I win if you just become somehow my friend? Do, do I somehow win if I can just get other people to like me? Do, do I win... Listen, if I have to win your favor, then is it really worth winning? Isn't that what Jesus was saying? Why are you clicking on stuff? You could be playing the game right, but are you playing the right game? 
and you can get it right all day long and you, you can succeed relationally and materially and you can get status and you can get power and you can get position. You could even be a really good preacher. But if you don't do it for the right reason, you could get all the cookies that you want, but is it real? Is it real? Those of you who are over 50, I don't want you to raise your hand just yet. How many of you have ever clicked on worthless stuff that wasn't worth clicking on? Raise your hand. Those of you who are under 50, there's a lot of wisdom in this room. Like how, how you measure your life is going to be so important. And Jesus wants nothing more for you than to get your life right. And so Jesus gives us wisdom on multiple levels. And, and six times in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this one simple phrase, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, you, you've heard that it was said, and he would quote some rabbinic tradition that, that has been passed down from the law of Moses, and, and he would then say this, these words, but I say to you, he's not going to pile on top of it, but he's going, to re, he's going to correct the value system and the belief system. He was speaking to people who had perfected the, the appearance of righteousness. Jesus recognized that so many people in this world have the right behavior, but there's not the right belief. That, that belief, beneath the behavior isn't the right belief. Jesus wants his followers to possess the actions that will align with his values. That, that's the good life. That, that, that's what winning looks like. Jesus didn't just play their game. And can I, you know this, that's why they killed him. He, he touched lepers that they wouldn't touch. He spoke with women that they had devalued. He, he literally challenged the social values by associating with people who were ethnically and religiously far different and had nothing in common with the, their Jewish world. And that's what they hated about him. See, G Jesus didn't just come in and endorse their, or elevate their value system. He challenged their value system. And he went up on a mountainside and he sat down one day and he began to teach them. And he started to dig out beneath all of those behaviors, all of those actions to literally identify and challenge what is it that you believe. And today, Jesus challenges his followers just like he was back then. We, we talked about it last week. One of the things that Jesus said when he challenged his followers is, hey, listen, you, you know, you heard it said, don't murder. But I want to challenge you to think through your anger. You, you, you know what it is to, to think through adultery. You know how to deal with adultery, but I want you to think about lust. You, you know how, to, how God's view and values divorce versus marriage. But then... Jesus kind of expands that in other areas like this. He said this, you've heard that it was said, love, love your neighbor. Well, love your neighbor, that's easy to measure. He said, you've heard that it was said, do that. But I say to you, no, love your enemies. Lo love your enemies. Well, Jesus, that's going to change everything. Why, why, why would I do that? That's my question. Why, why would I do that? Why, why should you do that? And the answer is the grace of God, the love of God in your life. The, the grace of God be, literally becomes our motive. The scorecard is totally based on his grace and his love towards you. The, the grace of God has to become the operative word in our life. Listen, you can't insist that God treats you a certain way and then you go and treat other people in a completely different way. Like when God is gracious to you, you want grace is going to flow to you, but not only to you, it has to flow through you. The, the grace of God is going to challenge your motive in life. And the text says that when Jesus finished teaching all of these things, they were amazed at his teaching, not because he was funny, not because he, he expanded on Scripture, not because he had a, a great object lesson, not because of human wisdom, but because he had authority. See, the teachers of the law were teaching on the basis of appearance. But Jesus challenges that in Matthew 6. He, said, he says this. This isn't, listen, I want you to know this. This isn't a scripture on giving. It's a scripture about intention. It's a, it's a scripture about motive. It's a scripture about the reason why you give. And he said these words, so when you give, he assumes that you're going to give. 
to those in need? It's not an if question. It's a when question. He's making the assumption that your actions are going to align with what you say you value, what you say you believe in, that your behavior is going to reflect your beliefs. And, and listen, I've learned that the greatest way for me to know whether I'm winning in life is not to ask other people or to, to, or to go look at an external scoreboard to find out how I'm doing. The, the size of my bank account is not a good indication of how I'm doing in life. The car that I drive, the size of my house. Listen, when my actions align with his value system, then I'm winning. And when I measure my behavior against my beliefs, then I know how I'm doing. And listen, it's really cool when you get into that place. And I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not there all the time, but when I am there, I, man, it's an awesome sensation to know that you're doing what God is asking you to do. When I'm, when I'm living from the point that I don't need other people to notice me because my father is keeping score. Because my dad is keeping score. I, I don't need validation from other people in areas of my life to know whether or not I'm doing what is right. Like You don't give so people will, will see you. You don't, you don't share with those in need so other people will notice you. You don't even give so that you'll get a tax benefit. Jesus said, no, no, if that's your motive, then that's going to be your reward. In other words, your, your motive is going to determine the reward that you get. If my motive for generosity is simply to be seen and to be noticed for what a great giver I am, then that's going to be my reward. If, if I want someone to acknowledge that somehow my gift is good or that I am good or that I did a good thing, then that's going to be my reward, just simple accolades. It, but if I have a deeper motive, Jesus is really clear, then I have a greater reward. I, I'm not waiting for some pot of gold to, that awaits me in heaven. Pots of gold in heaven is not why I'm doing this. It's, it's not about you getting your reward in heaven. It's about you getting your reward from heaven. Jesus said these words, then your father. He, who, who sees what is done in secret. That's the key to this passage. That's scary to a lot of us to think that God is watching over us all the time, that God sees what I'm, I'm doing, but God is the one keeping the score, and it doesn't matter what other people say. See, when I live the good life, when I live his way, there's a certain validation and confirmation that, that can only come from him. But listen, if I do things for, if I, if I do it for people, then my reward comes from people. My motive is going to determine my reward. If I, if I simply am doing this so that for you, then you hold the reward for me. But if I'm doing this for him, and like this applies to every area of your life. And so you know what Jesus does? Jesus applies this, this thought, this concept to, to the area of generosity. You let me ask you something. Why do you give? Or why don't you give? If you don't know why you give, do you know why you should? See, in the Old Testament, you, you, you will read about an obligatory system of giving where I bring my tithe because I have to, because I might be under a curse if I don't. Or I bring God the first fruits of all that I produce and, and even beyond what, he, what my increase might be because I have to. It's an obligation-oriented system. And that's literally how a lot of us live. And that's how so many of us think. But grace, the grace of God changes, it changes the way you think. Because Jesus said these words, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. I, I came to give you a different reason. If that's, it's not that I, I'm doing it because I have to or because I got to. I, I'm doing it because of the grace of God in my life. I, I now want to. It's a shift in my perspective, my mindset. And at first you may give because you think you should. That, you, that may be how you measure righteousness in your life. But pretty soon, as the more you give, the, the deeper the reason will be, the deeper the motive to be generous will become. Because when your reason gets deeper, 
you, when you start saying I'm giving to God and I'm serving God, not because I have to, not because people might notice me, not because I, I might go to hell if I don't, but because God, listen, because God has been good to me. His grace has, has been good to me. I've been given it. And Jesus says this, then your father who sees what's done in secret, he, he will reward you. My motive is going to determine my reward. Think about it this way. Those of you who have morning devotions, do you have morning devotions so that you could take a picture of it and post it on Instagram? With a picture of your coffee mug and Colossians opened up to keep up appearances, like devotional selfies. Is that why you do it? Like, do you believe me when I say, hey, your motive will determine your reward? Like, you'll get noticed, but when you only get 12 likes, don't come crying to me because I preached to you Matthew chapter 6, right? Like if you live by the model that says, you know, if, if I will just do this, then God will do this. And you can fill in the blank however you want. If, if I do this, fill in the blank, then God will do this for me, fill in the blank. If, you, if your motive on giving is, is literally about only what you're going to receive, then you've missed out on the blessing and the reward of God. Because Jesus would like for you and I to get to the point where his grace has literally changed us so much that you don't even have to think about what you're going to give. You don't even have to pray about what you're going to give. You don't even know your left hand is given in your right hand. If your motive for coming here today was simply so that you could receive instead of give, if, then you'll get your reward. You'll get what you're after. Motive will always determine your reward. Because, let me say it this way, the good life is completely measured in a different, by a different standard. We have been given everything that we need to be a blessing to others. And as followers of Jesus, we are no longer dependent on what other people might say is good. We're not motivated by the applause of men. We're not waiting for compliments from, from our, our, our neighbors. Popularity has no value. Position has little value. Pleasure has little value. I want God to measure and motivate my life. Because life is way too stressful for me to try to keep score on all the things that are going on. And there's far too many people that have too many opinions about what my life should be. And it's too much for me to keep up with anymore. But my father who sees what's done in secret is going to keep the score. And I can tell you this, that his grace can motivate you to give. I got to say this. I have never preached from a state of emergency when it comes to generosity, that we need people to give. And so I'm not going to start now. So I'm just going to put a challenge in front of you, and then I'm going to give you a promise. I'm going to give you a challenge, and I'll tell you a promise. I'll make a promise. Because I, I believe that there's an opportunity for you to start operating according to his values, where you're putting God first. And so I'm going to ask this of you. I'm asking you to begin the practice. If you're not already doing this, if you're, if you're far beyond this, you understand. But for those of you who are not, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you to start practicing the idea of, of giving the first 10% of what you make to God. I'm asking you to come up with a systematic and strategic plan for you to align your actions with his values. To align your behaviors with, his, with your beliefs. And I promise you, I, I promise you that we will use whatever you give as a church to, to, build, to build a church, to, to continue to advance the kingdom of God, to, to preach the gospel, to make a difference not only in our community as we love Dallas, but around the world, to give glory to his name. Because God is, throughout his word, God, God always has this deep concern for the poor, for those in need, physically and spiritually. And, and so I promise you that God has a deep concern for those who are poor, who are oppressed, who are powerless. And we will use whatever you give in order to be a blessing to others. That's my prayer. You've got a challenge. 
I'll fulfill my promise. Let me pray for you. God in heaven, thank you, thank you, God, that you don't measure the way that we do. Thank you that you, you've given us a way of escape. You've given us a, a different opportunity, God, because of your grace. Father, there are those people in this room who you've yet to experience your grace, who, who are still trying to measure their life by the accumulation of things and the accolades of people. And God, you just want to love them and you just want to shower grace upon them. God, would you just work in their lives? May they reach out to someone in this room who could explain your grace to them. Father, Father, we know that you've asked generosity from us because you're a giver. You've given the ultimate sacrifice of your son. And Father, because of that, Father, we in turn need to give. Father, may we be motivated by your grace. May we be measured by your grace. Father, find us faithful to a task. Father, help us to reach this, this city and this world. Help us to meet the needs of those in need. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen.